If you are serious about your portfolio for 2024, then get yourself to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia on January 21st and 22nd. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We're counting down to the next VRIC, January 21st and 22nd. There's a link in the description below where you can get your tickets. But we are, of course, bringing the VRIC to you with our series of expert online panels. And today we're joined by Lobo Tigre of the Independent Speculator and Rick Rule of Rule Investment media and when i thought about what would be my dream panel here on the vric it was these two gentlemen so it's a real honor to have you both on welcome to the show uh my honor and our honor i believe jesse yes thank you very much it, it i don't know how much discussion we'll have here because you're you've got me with one of my two great mentors in this space rick and doug obviously doug casey yeah um so I'll have to see if I can contradict my master in any way. I've, maybe I've learned <laughs> something he hasn't. I don't know. That's, well, tough, both, that's a tough order to fill. Both, both of us are proud of our acolyte who has worked two decades to become an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am very excited to be speaking with both of you. And I want to kick off the conversation with uranium. This is a commodity that has performed exceptionally this year especially when we look at the spot price in particular, up to 15-year highs, many of the equities performing very well also. I was wondering what both of your current outlook on this uranium sector is. Do you think we could be overbought here for someone new to the space? Is, is this a time to maybe let the natural volatility of the sector work in your favor and wait for a correction? Or do you think you know that there's a lot of ways to go from here to the upside? And Rick, I'll start with you. Uh, I'll answer the question a little differently. I think the easy money has been made. The easy money is made when a commodity f moves from hated to unhated. And that's all done. Um, you know, in a select group of juniors, there was an easy triple to make. When in 2021, 2022, uranium disappointed the faithful and people sold it off. That's over. The structure of the uranium market is moving, first of all, to a place where the incentive price is actually exceeded, but also to where more goods trade in the term market than the spot market. And this is important because for the first time in history, really, we'll have certainty of uh, price for the producers who are smart enough to hook up with a investment grade credit taker, which will increase the visibility of their revenues and also make previously unfinanceable deposits financeable. So I think the question really depends on what kind of investor or what kind of a speculator you are. Right. Well, Lobo, I'll turn to you now. Your thoughts on the uranium sector at present. I know you've been writing about it a lot in your newsletter, which I also follow. Um, you've been kind of banging the table about uranium uh, for the course of the year. There's a lot of commodities that you've been avoiding. Um, with a, with a potential recession coming through, but you always say the one thing I'm looking for is uranium plays at good prices that I don't yet have in my portfolio. So what are your current thoughts on the sector? Um, do, you, do you echo Rick's sentiment that the easy money has been made? Yeah, but I'll address your question more directly. My outlook is uh, extremely bullish for years, if not decades to come. This is a, it's both a structural supply issue. It's a political constraint issue. It's an idea whose time has come issue. The green agenda hitching its wagon to uranium or the other way around is a game changer. So, I mean, the stars could not align better. So we have the fundamentals. We've got the technicals even. We've got the storium to go with the uranium, to quote my master here. Um, you know, all of this is extremely bullish. But as Rick said, we've reached the incentive price. So even a bull, you, you don't want to be a blind bull. You want to be a rational bull. You want to be a disciplined bull. You don't want to go charging at every red cape. Some of them have freaking swords behind them. So, <laughs> I mean, right? So, um, I, I, as I said, my outlook is extremely bullish. But you asked outlook for 2024. We're doing this at year end. And I got to say, my outlook for 2024 is proceed with caution. 
And having reached the incentive price, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, it's the top, it'll go down. Markets frequently overshoot, right? You know, overbought, oversold is the norm. <laughs> How often is something precisely at the right equilibrium price, if such a thing even exists? Um, but, but high prices cure high prices. Uranium isn't rare. The uh, incentive price is now incenting not only mothballed production, but lower quartile assets to come online now. This is happening now. You, you know, my, my riff on Rick is forget about inevitable, forget about imminent. I want happening now. So this is happening now. And there's another thing that's new, thanks to our friends at Sprott, um, is there's a, there's a new secondary supply source on the market. Now, Sput is constrained from selling the uranium it hoovered up in the last couple of years. But the rest of the copycats out there are not. To my knowledge, none of them are as constrained as Sput. Um, so what I'm saying is we're reaching incentive price and we have a question mark now. How many of these pounds that were bought at $25, $35, even $45, $55, how many of those pounds are willing to come back on the market at $90. I mean, $90 is a double for somebody who bought at 45, which seemed, you know, a little bit risky at that time. And bear in mind that some of these sellers or potential sellers, <clears throat> they bought with the intention to sell. They're not spot. They're not hoovering up to sequester these pounds. They're not end users. Some of them are mining companies that put their money where their mouth was you know, bought uranium when they said it was cheap. They said it was going to go up. Okay, we'll, we'll eat our own cooking here with the goal of selling this stuff so we can pay for our mind build or our expansion plan or whatever it is that they're going to do with that money. So they're not traders if they come back to the market to sell. That's what they bought for. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, and, you know, that's got to be pretty tempting if you've got capital requirements in 2024 Proceed with caution. And one last thing, sorry, I don't want to go too long on about this, but I, I this has been my mantra. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are pissing and moaning about, you know, the uranium's up and the uranium stocks aren't. Well, you know, just look at the big ones. They are up. If your uranium stocks aren't up, you need to ask yourself some hard questions about stock selection. And I'm being nice. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very good point, actually, because I get those comments all the time on Twitter I see them on YouTube all the time. Um, one thing I want to ask for my own benefit, and I think it could be a benefit to some of the viewers as well, I don't have much of an exit strategy when it comes to the uranium sector. And this could apply to all of the commodities we're going to be discussing today because we're going to get to some other ones as well. And that is when to know when maybe it's time to take profits off the table because on social media, I see a lot of people when it comes to uranium talking about, you know, we've got a way long ways to go from here. I'm holding for the long run. I won't sell X equity for cheaper than this set price. It's at least going to go to that. And my thinking is, how do you know exactly wh where it's going to go? And, and, and how do you come to such a figure? Is it just an arbitrary number? Um, so I'd like to pose the question to both of you. How do you think about exiting positions? Do you scale out? Do you sell all at once? Does it depend on the situation? And uh, Rick, I'll start with you. Well, I think there's two uh, two answers to that question. I'm a determined speculator and a determined contrarian. So I've exited about two thirds of my junior positions. Uh, they gave me what I wanted. I owned them because they were unloved and they had to go up. Then they went up. In, in other words, my objective was reached. So first of all, I sold enough to get my money off the table. Then I sold enough to pay the capital gains tax. And then I sold some more just for sport to make myself do it. And the stuff I sold for sport, I really sold by thinking, is there anything that I can do with the money that seems more intelligent than staying in this uranium junior? Do I want to buy Exxon Mobil uh, and enjoy the dividend? Do I want to move into the roundly hated silver sector? In other words, do I have something that inspires more greed in me than the uranium stock that I would be selling to finance it? If the answer is yes, it's pretty clear. I think that's a great way to approach it. And Lobo, I know you have 
a strategy that you use for exiting positions. Maybe you could uh, touch on that for us and, and let us know how you go about that. Point, point of clarification. It's yeah. taking profits is not the same as exiting. You notice right. that Rick say, I'm done, I'm out. He got his money back. Like he's risk free. How, how sweet is that? Speculation. It's high risk. You stay up at night because you're taking risk. How sweet is it to be able to speculate with free money? Like you've got your initial investment back off the table. It's a completely different question from when to sell, when to get out. So yeah, okay, you're a uranium bull. And, you know, but that's no reason not to take profits. And I would say, yes, this applies to everything, all commodities and resource speculation. But particularly in uranium, it's uranium is a special case because it's the one commodity that can almost literally melt down on us. Right? There's, there's no copper reactor that's going to go critical and cause everybody to stop using copper around the world. right? But that can happen in uranium. These stocks can basically go to zero in a heartbeat. Every single one of them. The best one in the space can do that. And nobody can tell you that will never happen. Okay, maybe not zero, but pretty close. If there's a major nuclear incident and we have you know Fukushima all over again, or even bigger, because really Fukushima was a tsunami. But if there was something that really scared people about the inherent safety of nuclear energy, this whole nuclear renaissance can go away. These stocks can go to zero or, or close enough that it doesn't matter. So in that context, not taking profits when you can, not going risk-free, forgive me, that's just stupid. I mean, that's just asking for pain. I mean, a day late is too late. So if you've got profits, um, you want to go risk-free. And then, yes, my strategy is, is not to jump the gun and go too early on this. My my other mentor, Doug Casey, his longtime strategy was you sell half on the first double. It's very simple. You get your money back off the table and you let the rest ride. I have nothing wrong with that. But if you do that, when something's really on a tear, you you take a 10-bagger and you turn it into a five-bagger. So my modification is to, instead of selling the moment I get that double, is to put a kind of trailing stop loss on it. It's not a stop loss though. I call it an upside maximizer, but basically it's a ratcheting trigger. So that instead of selling at that first double, I sell as, you know, as long as it keeps going up, I stay long. But the moment it rolls over, that's when I get out and take profits. Now, how much profit to take, you know, at the very least, I wanna get my initial investment back. If I feel there's a very high risk speculation, maybe I'll take more or all of it, but that's a different choice. you know. And, in terms of selling, like actually closing positions, and this isn't just uranium, this is everything. And I think Rick would agree with me. It's basically, has the basis for speculation gone away? Has the unanswered question been answered, either positively or negatively? And, and look at what he said. He said, you know, I speculated for this reason. They, they delivered. So the question was answered. And of course, don't forget a negative answer. People who hold on to stocks when the company fails to deliver what they're supposed to do have themselves to you know act you know to blame. And when you point the finger, look in the mirror. If you do that, if you hold on to your dogs and you know they're dogs, it, it's you who's doing that. Sorry. Very well said. The era of globalization has now come to an end. Countries and corporations are right now racing to secure the materials they need for their supply chains. If you are serious about your portfolio for 2024, then get yourself to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia on January 21st and 22nd. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people need to hear that. I want to shift over to gold now. Obviously, exciting times for the sector with gold having hit all-time highs this year. A lot of people were forecasting that in the sector. Of course, there was a lot of, of wild hyperbole being thrown around that once gold hit all-time highs, it's going to be off to the races. We're going to be at 2,500. We're going to be at 3,000 in, in short order. And obviously, we're we're hovering around the 2,060 And don't forget level. the brick gold currency that was going yes. to be announced for yes. sure on August 25th. Well, hey, the Russian embassy in Kenya said so, so it it, it has to be true. Um, so th this is, uh, in in my mind, it's very exciting time for times for gold. But uh, sentiment in the precious metal sector, especially silver, which we're going to get to later, as as Rick alluded to, um, isn't excellent, particularly when it comes to the equities, because 
it seems that they aren't performing along with the metal, kind of a similar situation to uranium um, for for a lot of them. So what are your thoughts on the gold sector, both the metal itself and the equities and where we're headed in 2024? And Lobo, I'll start with you on this one. All right. Well, <laughs> I stood in front of a large audience of gold bugs in New Orleans in November of 2022, and I said that my highest conviction trade for 2023 was uranium, the other yellow metal. I didn't get booed, there were no tomatoes, uh, but I bring this up because I stood in front of that same audience this November, and I said my highest conviction trade for 2024, the next year, is gold. And the reason why I'm stressing this is because, you know, gold bug is bullish on gold. What kind of headline is that, right? You know? <laughs> but I'm not a permable. In fact, even last summer, when we were looking at the, you know, the, the the dance between the central banks and the race to debase, the balance of the 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 on the foreign exchange and so on, um, I, I actually made a bearish call on gold, and I said we're likely to see a correction in the near term, and I got that right. And I don't say I'm always right, but I'm, I'm only pointing this out to say that I'm not a permable. So please don't discount everything I'm about to say, uh, just because oh well, he's always bullish on gold. Uh, but I am extremely bullish. I, I feel as strongly about gold looking into 2024 as I did about uranium in 20, looking forward to 2023. And if you recall, at the time, you know, uranium had spiked in 2021 and then it came back and people were leaving it for dead. Like, what's wrong? Oh, my gosh, it's been months since uranium went up. Like a month is a long time and for a speculator somehow. You know, Rick Rule's long weekend quip. But anyway, so you know, at that time, uranium stocks were hated, and the you know, absent a nuclear accident, the fundamentals were just there. Rick's criteria of uh, Japan restarts was starting to happen. My criteria of long-term contracts starting to be signed was starting to happen. Like these were happening now things. So it was an easy call in 2024, 2023 to pick the other yellow metal. I I look at that this way almost as a win-win for 24 and gold. I still am in the hard landing camp. I think that set, opens the, the the fear sphincters again and creates more safe haven demand. I think it also, for anybody that's forward looking, which the markets supposedly are, they know that the powers that be are going to respond with more money helicopters and all that good stuff, which is going to bring on more inflation and gold leads inflation. It, it, people often say, well, how come it doesn't correlate with CPI? Well, it moves before. We saw that in 2020. I think we'll see that again in 2024. And I'm perhaps waxing too rhapsodic here. But my, my message is I'm looking at the macro situation much more than the technicals or anything else. And it just, I may be wrong. I, you know, maybe we don't get the recession, but if I'm right, I think golds go screaming up. And if I'm wrong, if we go into happy days again, that's bullish for all commodities anyway. If gold goes into a commodities bull starting from a base around 2000 bucks an ounce, I think that's phenomenal for gold. That's what I meant by a win-win for 2024. That, that doesn't mean I can't be wrong, even wrong about that, but th that's the way I see it. Rick? Jesse, you led the question with a common fallacy, which is to say that broke that gold is broken out to all time highs. That's all time highs in nominal dollars. If you measure gold in real dollars, gold's got a lot further to go. I personally couldn't care uh, about whether gold is at nineteen hundred or two thousand or twenty one hundred. I own it not because I hope it goes up, uh, but because I'm afraid it's going to really go up. And the set of circumstances that would cause gold to go up would do damage to the rest of my standard of living, which why the way is very good. So I don't own it as a greed trade, hoping for $2,500. I own it as a fear trade, afraid of $8,000 or some number like that. Like Lobo, when I juxtapose the upside to the downside, it begins to look stupidly attractive to me. Could it go to $1,700? Sure. Could it go to $7,000? Sure juxtapose those two numbers and try and talk yourself out of buying gold. With regards to the gold equities, uh, I think the gold equities have done it to themselves. If you look at the length and breadth of junior miners in the world, out of maybe 2,000 of them, there may be 200 that are viable, which is to say that 90% of them are flotsam and jetsam. How could a sector that is 90%, you know, unwitting or unscrupulous, go up as a sector? 
And then if you really want to get depressed about gold equities, look back to the decade of 2000 to 2010. The gold price goes from 250 bucks an ounce to 850, 1850 bucks an ounce. And the free cash flow per share of the XAU, Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index, fell. It took real management skill to, de lower, to deliver lower free cash flow per share when the commodity that you produce increased sevenfold. So those seven or eight gold investors that are left, myself among them, uh, are probably rightly skeptical about the management's ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, given how well they've done in the past. But I own them anyway. Here's why. The market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets in the United States is less than one half of 1%, which is to say, if you take the value of all savings and investment assets in the United States, precious metals and precious metals-related ass assets comprise less than one half of 1% of that. According to J.P. Morgan Chase, <laughs> no, no friend of gold, the median market share, pardon, yes, the median market share of precious metals and precious metals related equities over 40 years is 2%. So if the type of fear I have uh, about certain aspects of the monetary system comes to be true, I'm not suggesting that gold is going to dethrone the dollar. I'm, cons I'm, I'm saying it's going to lose the fight less badly. I'm saying in particular that we're going to revert to mean. And if we revert to mean, we have a fourfold increase in demand. And that is precisely what I think is going to happen. Let well, me jump in because yeah, yeah, please. before we move on to silver or something, because I, I I appreciate that Rick went from the metal to the equities. And I think that's really important. And I absolutely agree. I don't speculate on gold. I don't even see it as an investment. In my view, my gold is my savings. And I love that it's painful to sell these beautiful works of art, you know, an ounce at a time. You know, that that makes you not dip into your savings unless you really need to or have a terrific opportunity. The stocks are something else. Um, and the good news here is for the reasons that Rick has mentioned and others, that the stocks are pretty, maybe not as bad as silver stocks, but they're hated. I mean, look at look at the HUI, look at the XAU, look at the gold stocks versus gold. And you've got gold bugs pulling their hair out, what's left of it, you know, for most of us who've been watching this. <laughs> I took that personally, Lobo. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> <laughs> beard is white okay i'm getting there um you know it it's just like you know you, you nominal all-time highs and the and and the gold stocks are just in the gutter people don't want them and okay fair enough the industry as a whole has done a horrible job you know keeping their balance sheets in order and, and managing well just everything really but the better companies have not and, you, and you're I, I think this is a fantastic setup for, for anybody with the courage to be a contrarian in this space. The fact that you can have gold, okay, it's just nominal all-time highs, but that makes headlines and it brings attention. There's people who are beginning to pay more attention to this. And particularly since it's not one off anymore, we're, we're going on three years of nominal all-time highs, right? It starts in 2020. Here we are almost 2024. And people keep expecting it to fall off a cliff like it did in 2011. I, I think going on the fourth year, it's not 2011. We can we can already set that scenario aside. And at some point, people will wake up like, oh, my gosh, it's not going away. Or if I'm right and we're going into a new bull starting from 2000 as a base instead of 1000 or whatever, you know, or 1200. I, I think the whole sector gets a lot of attention. And I think the stocks really rip. And the, the fact that we can get, okay, 90% of them may be crap, to be a little more frank than, than Rick, um, but the 10% that aren't and are thrown out with the bathwater, I, I think that's a fantastic circumstance to be taken advantage of. Well, let's shift over to silver. Um, as Rick has mentioned quite often, it's one of the most hated commodities on the planet right now. Talk about people throwing in the towel. Whenever I post videos, anything to do with silver, the amount of comments I get of just people, they're almost angry when they're when they're disparaging silver. It's useless. It hasn't done anything. It's manipulated. E everything you can think of um, for, for why it's a terrible uh, investment or an asset to own. So uh, Rick, I'll start with you on this one. Have you ever seen the silver sector this unloved in your investment career? And do, what sort of opportunity do you think the sector presents at present? 
I absolutely have seen Silver This Unloved, which is why I'm so attracted to it. Uh, 1988, 1989, Silver was perversely a four-letter word. I mean, people really, 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 truly hated it. Uh, and we took advantage of that to build two companies, one called Silver Standard, which went from 72 cents to $45, the other called Pan American Silver, which went from 50 cents to about $45. It is precisely the fact that there is so much hate around silver. The Reddit crowd was jilted and there's no, <laughs> there's no lover like an angry lover, you know? Uh, I look for hatred. I look for circumstances where I have no competitors. And I, I particularly enjoy circumstances where I have no competitors, where I have lots of volatility in the sector. And silver gives you vol volatility in steroids. I don't know why it is, Jesse, but in my experience, gold has to establish the precious metals narrative. I suspect because the fear buyer comes first. But when the fear buyer establishes the momentum in the precious metals narrative and the generalist investor comes into the sector, when they begun, begin to come into silver, and in particular, when they come into the silver equities, the move to the upside, although it occurs later, is further and faster and is really, truly dramatic. And I look at the sector now, uh, I look at a company you know, that releases really good drill holes in context, right? Not like one hole wonders drilling right down an epithermal vein, but in fact, a panel of holes that establishes tunnel, uh, tonnage and grade and the stock comes off. There is nothing I like to see more than that. There is nothing I like to see more than demonstrable value thrown away. Because I know that when sentiment returns, the people who are absolutely unwilling to buy silver at $25 will be killing themselves to buy it at 50. Uh, I guess perhaps what I am is a pawnbroker to emotional people. I've now graded, Jesse, over 80,000 individual portfolios. And I've learned a lot about how people invest. And one of the things I've learned is that a market is not a source of information. It's a facility for buying and selling fractional ownership of businesses. If you take your information from the market, from momentum, you will always buy high and you will always sell low because that's what the market does. Uh, as an individual, it's not up to you. Well, it is up to you. You can be taken advantage of by the market or you can take advantage of the market. It's simply up to you. Buying silver when it's hated it just makes absolutely more sense than buying silver when it's loved. Yeah, and I think the silver squeeze movement kind of enhanced the emotional aspect of it because a lot of these people were coming over from the GameStop debacle and thinking they could somehow put some sort of short squeeze on silver and send it to the moon and everybody would make a ton of money. Um, and and their efforts did did send it uh, to to a decent price level. It seemed uh, if if causation was correlation in, in, in that case, or correlation was causation. Um, Lobo, your thoughts on the silver sector at present? I know you, you've you adopted the moniker Darth Silver. Um, you, you've mentioned that it is in many ways an in, more of an industrial commodity now. At times, at least it performs that way than a monetary metal. What are your thoughts at present on, on the silver sector and where it's headed? Yeah, I don't have my Darth mask around here for this interview. But yeah, it's our friends at Wall Street Silver who dubbed me that. And um, and I, I took it on because, look, if if you get mad because somebody says something that disagrees with your thesis, you're a silver bull and somebody's not, or a uranium bull and, some, and somebody's not, or whatever, and that makes you angry, like you're mad at this guy, he's wrong, he's lying, whatever, manipulator. Um, I suggest that that, is a clear signal that you do some deep soul searching on whether or not you are cut out to be a speculator. Because if you're that emotional, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult anybody here, but if you get angry because of people just talking about your investments, that's not a good sign. You know, if, if that pisses you off, well, how sound are your decisions going to be? Just, just a disagreement. Hey, Lobo, how, how about somebody like me who loves to be hated? Do I need therapy too? <laughs> you might, you might, my friend. But so I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to wax too philosophical here, but I think this is really important. People are setting themselves up for failure. And um, okay, so people, 
you know, and, you know, I know the hate is going to start coming here, but but you will be happy to know, haters of Darth Silver, that even Darth Silver is bullish on Silver going ahead, but not right away. I do think that it's material and relevant that Silver's industrial side is taking a greater role. We can see that in the price action. Overall, the correlation is still high with gold, but you watch the, the daily charts, the intraday charts, and they frequently look, silver looks more like copper than gold, right? That's, you know, that's a fact. And, and you can ignore facts if you want, you can call me names, but that is a fact. And if you're going to ignore facts and go with, you know, your emotional defense of your speculations, you're asking for trouble. So, Again, the good news is I actually think that longer term, the, the industrialization of silver, if you will, is net net a positive. It makes it a win-win. If the if you know the debasement of the fiat currencies of the world is great for gold and silver, and at the same time, if you get a commodities reflationary boom, that industrial side comes in. So there are scenarios where we can foresee where things seem to be okay, we're in a reflationary boom, the fear factor goes away. In gold, the bid goes down, but silver's industrial demand holds it up. So regardless of this pattern of, of silver lagging gold and then eventually more than catching up, setting that aside for a moment, there's a scenario where silver outperforms gold because of its increasingly industrial side. So I'm not anti-silver when I say that. I'm hopefully just trying to be a realist and look at what's actually happening now in the marketplace. Now, back to the thing which, which Rick referred to, that silver typically lags and then catches up again. That was an unbroken track record for 50 years. But that has always happened, that silver has more than delivered than gold at the end of that bull market, except in 2020. So we now have a broken track record. Now, OK, it's, maybe it's nine times out of 10 it delivers. So that's still a pretty good track record. But it's significant that the one exception is the last one. So you have to, if you're going to be rational about this, you have to ask yourself, has something changed? And maybe the answer is no, but we won't know until we have the data on the next bull market, right? And if silver doesn't catch up with gold again, you, you know, you really need to pay attention to that. So where I'm going with this is, believe it or not, I am bullish. I just bought a gold stock and that leaves only one stock on my shopping list right now. My current shopping list includes one stock and it's a silver stock. So Darth Silver, take it, take it for whatever that's worth. But I'm doing that with the cognizance of, you know, if I'm right about the recession in 2024, that will hurt the industrial demand. Before the money helicopters fly, the industrial demand will take a dip. So not only do we have even the most ardent silver bugs agree that silver lags at first, we have this recessionary scenario arguing for greater pressure on silver in the nearest term. So you know, you, you can be religious about silver if you want, but the, the macro setting right now tells me to be cautious about silver. And this one silver stock I'm willing to buy has a huge gold lining. <laughs> so I feel pretty comfortable. And it has unique circumstances that are, that are game changers for this story. So I mean, it's still cheap and so on. So I'm willing to go there, but I'm not generally shopping for silver right now. I'm waiting to see how the recession impacts silver. And I'm hoping that it gets even more hated. If I'm right about the recession and the great silver stocks, the best silver companies in the business get thrown out again with the bathwater. But that's a tremendous circumstance. I, I would look forward to that. Well, the oil and gas sector is another area where it is very unloved. Um, and I've been hearing wildly different calls on it. Everything from we're nowhere near peak cheap oil, there's plenty of it out there, to we're running out of oil and it's far more dire than people think. There's opinions all over the spectrum. Talk, of course, of the Permian Basin production rolling over, but it produced very well this year. So that led some people to doubt that thesis. Um, where do you both stand on oil and natural gas? Lobo, I know you've discussed in your newsletter that this is one commodity that you're currently sitting on the sidelines in in, in fear of a potential recession. Maybe talk to us about that. I, I do have thoughts on that, but I really would like Rick to go first on this one because, A, he made his first fortune and lost it in the oil patch. <laughs> uh, uh, he can tell that story if he wants, but he knows far more about it than I do. I do cover it, but he does know more. So I... I Great. Yeah. Rick. Let's, let's get Rick's take first. 
I, th I think my needs are different than Lobo's. Uh, Lobo needs to sell a newsletter uh, on a monthly basis. He needs now. Ironically, at age 70, without much time left on earth, I've become much more patient. Uh, and I think about deploying relatively large uh, amounts of capital over the five-year timeframes, juxtaposing juxtapo uh, both risk and reward. For what I do, the oil business is as good a business as there is. And from my point of view, this is a wonderful time. Oil companies are being priced uh, as though Al Gore uh, and Biden and Trudeau are right, which is to say peak oil demand occurs in 2030. That is downright stupid. It is downright stupid. Jesse, I want to leave a statistic with you to show you how stupid this is. I I'm not opposed to alternative energies. We need all kinds of energy. But humankind has now invested $5 trillion in alternative sources of energy over the last 40 years. And we have reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% all the way down to 81% with a $5 trillion investment. Population grows, material standards of living increase, demand for oil increases. Peak oil demand occurs in about 2065 and then tapers off over 40 years from there. So the valuation metrics are wrong. People are doing a net present value calculation with no recovery after 2032. The net present values are going to be higher in 2032 than they are today. Secondly, uh, the industry is under investing in sustaining capital. When I talk about the industry, I'm talking about the state-owned firms, everybody, to the extent of about a billion dollars a day, $365 billion a year. And they've cut new project expenditure outside the United States in half. This is a capital intensive business. If you starve it of capital, you go out of business. Production will be lower two years from now or three years from now than it will be today. As a consequence of those lower prices, if demand doesn't get absolutely destroyed, the balance of supply and demand will force prices higher. Meanwhile, because of advances in technology, the companies at these prices are minting a fortune, an absolute fortune, and it's cheap. I mean, not for a penny stock speculator, okay? For somebody who's hoping that he can bet X on a nickel stock and see it go to 75 cents, oil's not the right place to, pay, right place to play because you need market stupidity to cause that to occur. And the oil market's not a stupid market. It's a smart market. So it's not the right place for that kind of thing. But if you look at uh, the simple fact that sustaining capital investments are being constrained, uh, and that the best capital allocators in the business, the Exxon Mobiles, as an example, are spending $60 billion uh, increasing supply. If you look at the fact that the best companies are more than maintaining sustaining capital investments while increasing returns to shareholders by way of buybacks and dividends, it's difficult for me to see a circumstance that gets better than this. Very provided, well that you're in, provided that you're investing for returns. Uh, and not for psychological satisfaction or something like that. Right. And Lobo, your thoughts? I don't have too much to add there. I'll, I'll actually give credit to a different person, Lynn Alden, who gave me the idea of oil being like tobacco back in the day when it was choked off by government, became politically incorrect. People, investors fled the sector, but people didn't stop smoking overnight or, or still at all. And so the unloved sector became actually a phenomenal vehicle for returns. And the companies just kept, kept making money and paying out dividends and delivering for shareholders. I, I, and that analogy for oil, I think, is, is very apt. Um, my own, so I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish here. Um, I actually haven't really owned many oil stocks in the past, and I have stuck my toe in there. And the only reason when I'm not buying more yet is because again, I, my outlook is for a harder landing than is being credited and energy sector always goes down. Now uranium is different because it, you know we don't need to get into the whole thing, base load power, all that stuff. But it, it's highly, the odds highly favor cheaper oil prices going into this realization that, oh my goodness, we're in a recession. And by the way, even if team soft landing is right, which I don't think they are, a soft landing is it's still a landing. It, it is a recession. And soft landing means a recession, but not so bad. 
For it not to be a recession means to be no landing. The airplane just keeps flying high forever, right? So the, the consensus view, the team soft landing view is still for recession. That's bearish for oil, but that's near term. I think it's very near term. And I think that, the, you know, typically a recession lasts a couple of years and it works out. But after 2020, let alone 2008, I, I think the powers that be will react instantly. I don't think we'll even get to where the recession is causing real pain because it's no fault of the people's own. This is now our criteria for sending people stimmy checks. Well, the recession isn't any voter's fault. Oh, sorry, not voter. Dear concerned suffering citizen. Um, so I think the money floodgates open, and I think that's going to be great for oil prices and all commodities. But why would I buy in front of that? You know, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to time the market. I don't know where the bottom is going to be, but I suspect at the moment that it's in front of me. So I'm a shopper and waiting. I'm accumulating cash, and uh, you know, we'll see where we are in a year. Well, let's talk about briefly some other commodities, base metals. Um, iron ore recently rallied to around $140 a ton. Uh, do you think there's any of these, uh, maybe talk about iron ore specifically or any other metals that are currently on your radar, whether that's nickel, whether that's lithium or uh, anything else? And Lobo, I'll start with you. Uh, well, my general view, the quick take is I'm not buying any industrial minerals right now. I mean, it's like oil. It's the same argument. If, if I'm right, you know, I may be wrong, but my expectation is hard landing. And, and then the money floodgates open. But first, the realization of, oh, my gosh, the plane's going down. Right. So that being the case, why would I be copper, any of these? Um, iron in particular, though, it's much more of a China story than anything else. And China's been struggling with their reopening. That makes me nervous. Um, other things out there, uh, there, there might be a, a story. Maybe Rick will disagree. We haven't disagreed yet. We need to find something to disagree on. Maybe this will do it. I'm, I'm periodically people say coal is hated. Let's, let's get into coal. Coal is cheap. It's got to go up, right? And we still need it. As Rick says, we're going to need all forms of energy, alternative, mainstream, old stream, everything. We're going to need it all. That includes coal. Fine. Um, but coal isn't like gold that you can stick a high value of it in an airplane and it's fungible around the world. It tends to be regional markets. It's a bulk commodity. Uh, there's different qualities of it. There's impurities in it. There's, you know, it's, it's messier than <laughs> other commodities. And it is, it's it's one thing for investors to hate it. It's another thing for it to be the one in the crosshairs of the government. You know, the, the moment they don't need or is that much energy or they have a bit of, the coal is the first thing they're going to ax. It's the first thing they're going to come down hard on. They're going to ban, burn, you know, not burn, <laughs> the opposite, whatever. So so things like that make me nervous. The, the general answer is I want to see, I want to have confidence that the recession has done its worst before I start buying any industrial minerals. And then within that, I want to be very picky because you, know, you can make a contrarian case for something like coal, but it's 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 not a slam dunk in my view. Uh, you know, maybe Rick has a different view. Yeah, the coal debate. Let's hear it. I do. Uh, in the first instance, Lowell makes a good point about a recession. But my point about a recession is that between his other mentor, Doug Casey, and I, we have correctly forecast 17 of the last three recessions. And the time I have spent out of the market for the last 40 years has cost me a lot more money than the times I've been in the market and got caught. So I don't listen to my economic forecasting track record anymore, given that mine, like Doug's, is unblemished by success going back 40 years. I look at net present value uh, in a variety of circumstances relative to enterprise value. That's what I do. Lobo rightly points out that the coal mining business is different than the gold mining business, but he forgets why. The coal mining business is profitable. <laughs> Uh, and I have this wonderful, wonderful sense that I should enjoy return on capital employed rather than praying for return of capital employed. The largest year of demand for coal on record was 2022, eclipse in October of 2023. And despite the fact that our government, big thinkers like Biden and Trudeau, think that coal is an anathema, solvent governments uh, have a very different point of view. They need more power. They need to provide affordable baseload power to their constituencies. And irrespective of the wishes of the big thinker in the West or that noted energy theorist, uh, Greta Thornburg, I think is her name, Dr. Thornburg, 
um, when people around the world flip the switch, they want the lights to go on. And for most people in the world, that requires coal. Now, I certainly agree with Lobo that there is a variety of uh, chemical properties, that there is a variety of uses for coal. And I mistakenly, about three years ago, uh, confined my coal investments to metallurgical coal, the most politically correct form of coal. And by doing that, I deprived myself of about half the gains I could have enjoyed by taking the scuzziest possible coal uh, being sold into Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Egypt, places that didn't care very much about my political sensitivities. And I suspect that that'll be the case for a very long time. Uh, the folks at Glencore, uh, politically correct if ever there were any, uh, recently bought in a 40% interest in a coal mine from a partner of theirs. They owned the other 60. This mine has a 35-year reserve life, and they paid 1.5 times trailing cash flow for that purchase. In other words, the purchase has an 18-month payout for a, for a mine with a mine life of 35 years. Uh, people say, but Rick, what about carbon? You know, what about COP28? What about the 80,000 people who flew 1,200 private jets to Dubai to tell you to drive less? You know, those, those cats. When they talk about carbon, they're talking about a narrative. The reality is this. People in frontier and emerging markets believe that carbon should be measured per capita, not by country. And they point out the fact that China produces a bit more carbon than the United States, but with three and a half times as many people. They also point out that if you're concerned about carbon, you have to be concerned about historic loadings and all the historic loadings occurred in the West. So when the Western voters learn, like the German voters have, uh, the perils of the new energy economy, they discover two things. Their future, if they listen to their big thinkers, is a future that, occur, that, that includes blackouts and energy prices five or six hundred times, uh, five or six times as high as they are today. If you don't believe in fossil fuels as a Western consumer, and if uh, carbon credits are going to be passed equitably by use and take into account historic carbon loadings, you believe as a voter and a taxpayer and a ratepayer in $25 a gallon gasoline. You believe in 85 cent a kilowatt hour electricity up from 12, uh, up from uh, 12 cents. And I suspect as the voters are confronted with those facts, as they have been in Germany, that the outcome is very, very different. And irrespective of our feelings about coal, the arithmetic around coal is really compelling. Well, it's been an excellent conversation, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lobo, tell us about the independent speculator and what it is you do there. Well, uh, thank you for asking. For the three people still listening, in the independent speculator is it's sort of the Brent Cook model. I have my own portfolio. It's it's not just I may own some of these stocks. This is where I'm willing to put my own money. That's the idea. Full enchilada service. I also have something called my take, which is widely misunderstood. There's no portfolio. There's no recommendations. It's it's basically a sliceable, diceable database of hundreds of companies, sort of like Rick's reviews but uh, with a lot more material and explanation in there. And it's updated uh, monthly. So it's a research tool. And if you're not sure if any of these are for you, then I would suggest just subscribe to my free weekly newsletter. If you do, I promise we will not spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. You can see how I think, see how I do, uh, and then decide if you want to hire me as your due diligence guy. Great. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Rick, you're wearing quite a snappy shirt today. Tell us about Battle Bank and what's going on with that. Well, I'm celebrating retirement by starting a new bank, uh, something that I recommend for anybody who's concerned who's considering retirement, which is the same as considering suicide. Um, I love the banking business. I believe that banks should pay interest on deposits, which most big banks don't seem to believe in. I believe if you're an American that you should be able to save in almost any currency you want to. So Battle Bank will offer CDs in 22 currencies. We believe uh, at Battle Bank that your IRA is your IRA, not a receptacle for somebody else's financial products. So if you want your IRA to own a duplex or invest in private equity or own a franchise, we can do it for you. And we believe that bankers, that lenders should lend only to industries that I understand that they understand well. 
I don't believe that I can lend to a thousand industries because I don't know a thousand industries well, but I believe that I could lend against gold as collateral because I know gold. I believe that I can lend to mining companies. I believe that I can lend to oil and gas companies. I believe that I can lend against good collateral and good businesses to good people whom I know and understand. Uh, if that kind of bank makes sense to you, if a sanity-based bank makes sense to you, or if you're uncomfortable with your current bank, and if you aren't uncomfortable with your current bank, you're out of your mind, <laughs> take a look at Battle Bank. The other right. thing that I'd ask people to do is if you care what I have to say about uh, uh, resources, go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Like Lobo, or perhaps unlike Lobo, if you list your resource stocks, I'll rank them. No obligation. One through 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on issues where I think my comments might have value. Note that there are 3,000 resource stocks in the world. We can muster up coverage on 750 of them. So if you're looking for my opinion on consolidated orangutan or amalgamated moose pasture, probably not there. But for real resource companies, they're all in the place. Ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list, list your natural resource stocks. While you're at it, go to the Rule Classroom. Over 200 hours of instruct instructional programming on natural resource investing, all free. Rule Investment Media, Rule Classroom, Battle Bank. End of commercial. Great. Well, I'll put links to all of that as well in the description below. Once again, it's been an honor to have you both on, and thanks so much for joining us today. Our Thank pleasure. You.